like to mention that there is a Q&A tab at the top of the screen. Anytime you have a question, please type it into the Q&A tab, and I will be constantly looking for questions. I will read the questions and or paraphrase them and give them a good answer. Welcome to the Exit of Web Seminar on Comparing Failure Rate Data. My name is Bill Goebel. I've been doing functional safety now for over 20 years, and a lot of my background has been in failure rate research uh, and uh, probabilistic modeling of safety functions. You could say I'm certifiably crazy because I just love this stuff. I hope you enjoy it a little bit as well. I work for Exeda. Exeda is a global corporation with offices around the world. Uh, Exeda has a number of product categories, all having to do with automation systems safety, cybersecurity, and availability. We do maintain a lot of different product lines, and it looks like we do a lot, but everything is oriented towards our core constructs. I see a question. I cannot get a uh, comment. I cannot get the audio and corporate IS. I'll just look over the slides. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. We'll do our best uh, to keep moving. Exeter does safety lifecycle engineering tools, including one very relevant to this particular presentation, the SILSTAT data collection tool. Exeter develops procedures and methods, and in all cases, just checking status here, in all cases, okay, check, okay, good. Sorry, I wanted to clear out the questions so I can be ready if you, can, if you ask another one. Exa develops a lot of procedures. We develop a lot of data. We spend thousands of man hours every year uh, doing research on failure rate data, and we publish all of this information and make it available to everyone in the industry. It is clearly our objective uh, to make the world a safer place. Now let's talk about failure rate data. Many of you are signed up for the seminar today, I imagine, because you understand the need for failure data. In the safety life cycle, per IEC 61508, 61511, and other derivative standards, performance-based standards failure data is used to verify uh, a given design. Therefore, if we take a look at the very detailed step where that work is done in the safety life cycle, we need failure data, or if we don't have specific data, we can get it from an industry database. But the bottom line is we need failure rate and failure mode data for every component in a safety instrumented function. Where do we get data? Well, there are many sources. I hope many of you realize that there are quite a few sources now as compared to the uh, original days of the, uh, of the uh, IEC standards where there was very little when IEC 61508 was first released, the first part released in 1998. There are industry databases. In, in, in the old days, 80s and 90s, they tended to be uh, military or telecom based electronics uh, today um, it, it's very nice that we have the ARETA database which I would classify as an industry database we have company and group failure data estimates and I've traveled around to many different companies and I've found that many of them have a committee that meets and argues about failure rates based on their expert opinions and the group agrees on the numbers they will use in their calculations. And although uh, this isn't traceable or scientific, the fact is experts have opinions, and these opinions are valuable. 
but there's always a question about what's included and, and how the numbers were derived. Manufacturers generate field return data studies. I used to work for a manufacturer, and I used to do this. One of the problems with this source of data is, of course, manufacturers assume that a certain percentage of actual failures are returned because the failure count is primarily based on valid failure returns. And then, of course, there's this definition of what's a valid failure, and I can tell you I was taught to pretty much throw away a whole lot of this stuff because we didn't want to pay for a warranty return. But, in spite of all that, this data is also still valuable. There's a technique called B10, uh, documented in machine safety world, IEC 62061 and ISO 13849. That's a method based on cycle testing, and it's primarily applicable to mechanical and electromechanical components, uh, but it has certain limitations that, that make it effectively totally invalid. Uh, for low-demand process industry applications. Given these four sources and lack of comfort with them, Exida developed, or engineers at Exida developed the FMEDA technique uh, in the late 1990s. And today, the FMEDA technique is backed up uh, by a component database that accounts for design strength and is calibrated for the process industries. I'll be telling you about it. And lastly, of course, we do have end-user field data studies, and it's, it's, it's really exciting when a quality data gathering system um, provides good failure rate information. Unfortunately, many of the systems aren't up to snuff. They're, they're kind of weak, but every set of data has some value. In the old days, Mill Handbook 217F was a, a well-known and well-used database for electronic components. There were also many telecoms, British, French, uh, Telcordia, which is the old AT&T databases for electronic components, but most of these were abandoned in the 1990s. And Mill 217F was known for extremely high failure rates, but at least it generated numbers that could be compared. And there were very little data on mechanical parts. Fortunately for us today, the offshore reliability database does exist. It's, a, it's run by a consortium of offshore companies in the North Sea and operated by Sintef, a very reputable uh, safety company in Norway, uh, backed up by a number of uh, uh, university uh, researchers. And it provides very useful data on process equipment. They publish the PDS data handbook, uh, which is which is a full a nice set of failure rate, failure mode data, and they publish an accompanying, accompanying volume of information about um, their methods and how they calculate these numbers. And they effectively they sell it just like Exeter, but they effectively make their information public as well, which I think is a, a very good thing for the industry. And they keep it up to date with the latest release that I was able to find on the internet of 2010. So today, ORITA is a valuable data source. Company group committees are typically experienced experts to share their memories of failure rates. They estimate failure modes and events, and it, the results, of course, vary considerably on the specific experience of the individuals, but the results can be valuable, especially as an indicator of reality for comparison purposes. For example, uh, here's a set of failure rates from the German uh, Nemour group, uh, NE130 is the document name, and you will see they publish failure rates for pressure transmitters, temperature transmitters, level and flow. Uh, they do not publish for logic solvers, but they publish for final elements, uh, valves and actuators. One of the problems, and this is valuable, this is very useful. One of the problems with this, of course, is that we're not sure exactly 
uh, what the boundaries are, uh, what's included in a pressure transmitter, uh, for example. Does it include only the transmitting device, or does it include remote seals, uh, manifold blocks, or impulse lines? And what's included in this final element? Is this a remote actuated valve with a solenoid, an actuator, and a valve? We're not sure, but even if we don't know that, we can use this information. Manufacturers gather up and perform, gather up, uh, return, uh, return warranty information, in effect. And that can be a useful source of failure information. I will tell you that at Exeta, when we do a certification, if it's an, of an existing product or based on a previous product, we always study the field returns for purposes of, of looking for potential problems and making sure that a manufacturer's product is sufficiently safe for a given cell level. So we do get to see a lot of manufacturer field return studies, and we use them for comparison purposes, estimating and verification purposes. However, most manufacturers, including myself, when I was taught how to do this, um, mark many problems to be no problem found or not a problem. So you really have to be careful of the absolute failure rates here. However, this data can be valuable to identify root causes and compare. The B10 or B10D, which is danger, cycle test failure data method uses a cycle testing. And the method involves taking a set of products, typically 20 pieces, and recycling them until 10%, in other words, two pieces, fail. The number of total cycles until failure is called the B10 point, and a fundamental assumption is made that the failures during the useful life are a result of premature wear out, because in the end, a cycle test is a measure of useful life. There is a method, it's published, and it gives you uh, a, a crude number. We actually calculate, based on scaling the number of cycles per time in the application. And that gives you a constant failure rate during the useful life. But the assumption is all other failure modes are insignificant compared to premature wear out. Now, that might be a very valid assumption when a product is, is moving frequently and when a mechanical product is moving frequently, but I'm not sure if it's very valid. In fact, I'm 100% confident that failure modes, other failure modes become significant when products do not move frequently. And in the process industries, in many low-demand applications, a final element may sit without moving for a year or years. So I've come to the conclusion that the B10 type failure data is completely inapplicable for the process industries. Now, why do I say that? When O-rings and other seals are part of a product, like in a solenoid valve or an actuator or a ball valve or, or most of the types of products we use in the process industries, there are other failure modes, including stitching, cold welding, corrosion binding, and, and we've seen even metal-to-metal -metal binding uh, whenever uh, moisture is present. Most of these failures prevent that product from performing its safety function and therefore are dangerous. So you've got to be extremely careful about looking for the source of data. And if a data source has any derivation based on mechanically dynamic applications. It should not be used in low demand. Often, when a certification agency uses such a method, they will post a, a warning on the certificate. In this case, uh, the certificate states they've assumed at least 10 demands per year. So what this, age, this, this analyst is telling you is do not use this information uh, for process industries. I see a question. All right, you're asking. Right above the red line, it says low demand mode. Um, 
Yeah, I see that. Uh, I can only assume that uh, the analyst uh, didn't really understand the definition of low demand, or because, in fact, 10 demands per year violates the definition of, of low demand in 61508 and in 61511. So those two lines do contradict each other, and I have no explanation for that. Another data source is failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis. Late in the 1990s, it was very clear that by the time you waited for enough failure statistics in the field, most products would become obsolete. Think about that. In other words, we can't get data until you can't buy the product anymore. That is not going to work uh, for safety instrumented system performance design. And so a number of engineers who now work for Exeter, of course, in the 90s, Exeter wasn't even formed yet, but a number of these engineers got together in a group and created the FMEDA technique. And uh, we've, de uh, we've developed it significantly in the last uh, 20 years. In an FMEDA, a component database is used. The component database gives us the failure rates of every part. And it's a very detailed, systematic technique that evaluates the design strength. And so it'll generate failure rates that are attributable to a product in a given stressful environment. And at Exeter, we have enhanced the method uh, to include, uh, I think, seven different environmental profiles from subsea, uh, offshore topside, uh, chemical industry, uh, protected chemical industry, chemical petrochemical unprotected, and so forth. You add up all the failure rates of all the components and all the failure rates as a functional failure mode, and you account for the diagnostics for every single part, and you generate product failure rates, failure modes, and diagnostic coverage, and even useful life. However, it should be very obvious to everyone that the biggest negative of an FMEDA is that the accuracy depends on the component database. That's why it's very important that any component database used for FMEDA be calibrated for specific environments, and that is what we do at Exeter by doing constant comparisons between product level failure rates based on field data compared to the product level failure rates based on FMEDA. And actually, we will certainly compare any apples to apples that we can. We explain any differences, and at this point, we've accumulated over 100 billion unit hours of field failure data from the process industries. I'm pretty convinced that Exeter has the largest field failure database of anyone in the world. We make the component database available to the public, and we, uh, have, we publish the books, and we get comments uh, frequently, and we love a challenge because it means we constantly can improve and make better data. Now, what about these field failure studies? I mean, come on now. <clears throat> Isn't this the real source of information? I got a question. Does Exeter evaluate failure rates using cycle testing? And the answer is yes, we will. We have done that, and we will publish such numbers, but we try very hard to make it crystal clear the limits of that particular data. In other words, at this point, our research shows that if a product, especially a mechanical product with a seal, like an O-ring, remains motionless for a week, Stiction failure modes began to be significant and will increase the failure rate over the cycle test. But Exeter will do cycle testing, but we mark it very clearly as to what it means and how it works. That's a good question. Thank you.
If you're a traditional reliability engineer, you've learned the source of all failure data is field failure. Well, that's, that's right. And we've had some good field failure studies, and they are a rich source of failure rate data, and we need to use them for comparison purposes. One problem, however, is that a lot of the studies, the data simply doesn't record the useful information that we need to do a good job. And user field failure studies, those done by process industry companies, uh, have issues, and we've studied dozens and dozens of these failure reports, and we've, we've learned to ask very specific questions like exactly what is the process, when is a failure report written, and what is the definition of a failure. Ironically, different companies have very different definitions. Are as-found conditions recorded during a proof test, and what are the operating conditions? And when we gather up that, we can usually massage or uh, correct or categorize end-user data, and we are doing that right now. Fortunately, things are getting better every year. There are field data collection standards. Now, in my opinion, they're not very detailed and they're a bit weak, but things are getting better every year. Uh, obviously, we, we try to help people collect much better data, and we do that by creating a software package, uh, which we call SILSTAT, which has built-in taxonomy, taxonomies, which are failure rates and failure modes, and so failure modes, I should say, for every different kind of an instrument. And so we've, it's been designed with the help of several end users to be easy to use and yet gather up good quality data. Now, I talked about comparing failure rates. Take a look at this chart. We got a, what we believe is a really good set of data from a, a, a published paper on Dow Chemical. And I will say exit engineers have traveled to Ternutsen, Netherlands twice to review this data in great detail with the engineers at Dow, and they were most generous to accept uh, to give us time and, and host meetings where we were able to discuss the details of the report. They primarily published total failure rates, so in order to compare to FMEDAs or any other data source, we compare total failure rates. And when we do that, I'm pleased that we discover that the Dow data, this little blue dot, seems to be in the middle of a range of different FMEDAs, especially if we discount the FMEDA with the remote seal. Now, what that means is the FMEDA results seem to be well scattered, nicely scattered, around the Dow data. Now, I did specifically ask the Dow people what was included. They do not distinguish between old analog transmitters and new smart transmitters. They do not distinguish between the safety certified transmitters. They lump them all together, and when you average these numbers, that's a pretty good match. Now, we also looked at the ORIDA data, as published in OLF 070. Uh, a data source from the North Sea based on ARIDA, and but they only published what they call dangerous or dangerous undetected. So we sat down and uh, compared ARIDA, and during our visit to Norway, we discovered they do include maintenance and site-specific errors, and that roughly half of the failures are due to product and half are due to site specific. So we take the ARETA data, divide by two, and it turns out to be a very good match. It's right in the middle of a cluster of the FMEDA data. Not a bad match. What about solenoid valves? I mean, this isn't electronics. Pressure transmitters are primary electronics. All right. We took some FMEDAs from two fundamentally different designs, a pocket solenoid valve and a spool solenoid valve, and we compared that to the Dow numbers. And the Dow numbers is right in between these two 
a different, a simple, and a more complex solenoid valve. We averaged up a number of, of um, FMEDAs, reflecting a number of different designs, and the average came out like 4 times e to the minus 7, which is very close to the actual Dow number. If I take the arena number and divide by 2 to account for product failures versus site failures, even the arena number is right in between uh, the range of FMEDA numbers, and that's, uh, that's, very, that's very good. And, of course, that also means that the arena number matches up pretty nicely with the Dow number. We also compared cycle test results and we see that they offer orders of magnitude lower numbers. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, they've assumed premature wear out is the only valid failure mechanism. And they've scaled the results for a long period of time, which lowers the failure rate. We also compared it to several manufacturers' warranty data studies and discovered they generally offer a failure rate an order of magnitude or more lower than FMEDAs. So I will tell you at Exeter we do not accept SIP verifications based on cycle testing or manufacturers' warranty studies or FMEDAs based on uh, this kind of low data. We always check for credibility. We check certificates as well. I see another question. Thank you. What's the 2x factor? Oh, yeah, that, that's good. I didn't uh, explain it in detail, but that's another whole web seminar, but I'll give you a quick answer. When <clears throat> we traveled to Norway and attended a technical conference where we were debating FMEDA versus ORETA, it was clearly stated that ORETA felt that all realistic failures should be included in the failure rate, including maintenance-induced failures or other site-specific, what I call site-specific failures. In other words, failures that had nothing to do with the product manufacturer, but had everything to do with what I'll call the safety culture of a plant. And Exeter has done some sorting on two different databases, and we found that when we separate site-specific failures from product-specific uh, failures, um, the total failure rate is twice the product failure rate. FMEDAs cover product failure rates. In the Excellentia tool, we model site-specific failure rates differently. And so there's two important things to remember. FMEDA failure rates are product specific and do not include failures caused by maintenance or operational practices. The ARETA failure rates apparently do include, and the factor, the ratio is about 2x. Thanks for asking. But we will still get failure rate data, even when it's, when it's based on an unknown method. And we constantly compare such data. Now let's compare some actuators. We have the ORETA data. We have the Dow actuator data uh, down here toward the bottom. The actuator information is toward the bottom. We've got some FMEDA numbers in particular. Uh, we, we, we do note a big difference between spring return and double acting. In general, the double acting actuators have a higher dangerous failure rate, as you can see by the looking at the two FMEDA numbers. We put the certificate data that I just showed you into the comparison and uh, manufacturer's warranty study, and we discovered that the ORETA data and the Dow data is actually a bit low. The FMEDAs are coming in higher than the Dow uh, actuator numbers. No more numbers were included in the study. The no more any, we, we always compare every set of data we can. And uh, 
the Aurita numbers divided by two match up pretty nicely with the, with the FMEDA range, at least the bottom of the range. Uh, the fact is I do not know what uh, types of actuators were included in the Dow study, but one might guess they primarily use spring return based on the fundamental principle of de-energized to trip. We also can see very clearly that, again, the manufacturer's warranty data is highly optimistic and really should, should not be used by anybody that's conservative or anybody that, that wants to be realistic. Let's take a look at valves. Here's the Dow valve body number at the very top line. And again, we have the PDS data handbook based on our data. And we have the Nemour data, which also, by the way, kind of matches up with Orita divided by two. And we compare that with the FMEDAs. And we see, interestingly enough, the Dow data is at, is at the top of the FMEDA range. Orita unadjusted is right in the middle. Orita adjusted for 2x is below the uh, range of FMEDAs, and the more is just below. That indicates that perhaps those two points indicate perhaps the FMEDA data is too pessimistic. In other words, perhaps FMEDAs are generating failure rates that are too high. And the Dow number indicates uh, either the FMEDAs are pretty close or they're a little optimistic, depending on the valve type. But that's not a bad position to be in. Somebody says the data is too high. Somebody else says the data is too low. But again, we discover that manufacturers' warranty data, and in this case uh, from a uh, ball valve certificate, is extremely low and unexplainable. It is these comparisons that we use to actually calibrate FMEDA results with fuel failure data. So in effect, we're showing you exactly what we do all the time. Now, we have a lot more comparisons than I've shown you here, like hundreds and hundreds. And we find new things over the years, which is really good. Now, that does not mean there is no interest in further comparisons. Exeter is traveling all over the world to visit end-user sites, uh, to hopefully look at failure data. Even if it's confidential, we'll sign a non-disclosure. Even if we can't publish it, we have a lot of comparisons that I could not put into this presentation because they were considered proprietary by the data owners. But this is a way of properly calibrating a component database so a predictive methodology like FMEDA would give you good results. In the longer run, of course, that depends on good field failure data. And we're constantly looking for more data. And we're more than happy to come back and provide feedback on anyone's data set and to give full sets of comparisons to anyone who would like to see them. So I have some questions. Do you have any questions regarding failure data comparison? Do you have any data you're willing to compare? Please type in any questions you may have. Any comments? All right, we've got one. I am using, all right, uh, I am using failure data from a certificate, which is quite low. Is this valid data? Well, it's highly unlikely. I would do a comparison like we do. And if you are interested in a set of data to do a comparison, send an email. 
You can see my email address on this slide. And we will send you a set of data that we have gathered up from publicly available sources around the world, and you can do your own data comparison. If you find these numbers are way outside the range of realistic field failure data, you should conclude not to use the data from the certificate. It's another one. Manufacturer's failure rate data is based on warranty returns. And it is explainable that failure rates are low, yes, for many reasons. You know, we have never, you don't know for sure how many come in. You don't know for sure uh, and, uh, how many are in service, how many hours of service, and so forth. Now, it goes on to say many failures are assumed to be not returned. Yes, that's absolutely a fact. Um, I will tell you that at Exeter, when we evaluate a set of manufacturer's warranty data, um, we will calculate upper bound, lower bound. And depending on the price of the product, and quite frankly, the manufacturer's warranty procedure, uh, uh, terms and conditions, we will count 10% uh, are returned, or 30%, or 50%, or 70% and then we'll calculate upper lower bounds, and even that information is valuable to compare. So I'm not saying manufacturer's data has no value. It has great value. But I would be extremely careful about using it as an absolute failure rate. And as you can see in the comparisons we've done, many of the manufacturer studies are, are quite optimistic, as, as I was taught to do when I worked for a manufacturer. Should the data in the FMEDA show the confidence? Um, that would probably make a lot of people feel good, but in general we have a criteria of 90% uh, confidence factor. Uh, currently that is only justified by the statement in the 2010 version of uh, 61508 which asks for a 90% confidence. Now that could be interpreted as only a confidence interval on the statistical analysis, and Exeter just uses a, a chi-squared distribution, and we do calculate statistical confidence based on 90% confidence interval. But at this point, we have so much data, the confidence interval has virtually no impact. So we do describe the 90% confidence interval in our FMEDA reports, um, but we, there are so many, and we have a very detailed description in our component handbook of the exact method we use uh, to generate FMEDAs and the raw data for FMEDAs. Uh, but it takes a whole book to describe that, so obviously we can't, we can't put it on every certificate. Thanks for asking. I appreciate the question. Uh, any challenges are most welcome. How does Exeter determine the useful life? Uh, let me get this in. Is it based on the component with the lowest useful life as defined in the Exeter uh, component handbook? And the answer is yes. Uh, if there is an assembly of components and one component will wear out more rapidly than all the rest. That is the limiting factor. And um, the concept in useful life is that if you follow 61511, 61508, you will implement a, a maintenance process which replaces components before they reach the end of their useful life. So that's the only way to maintain your risk reduction capability that you planned in your safety life cycle. If you go past the end of useful life, what it means is the failure rates go up and rather rapidly or non-linearly. So what you get, of course, is uh, you've got a rapid reduction in your uh, risk reduction factors. Your safety instrument and functions aren't nearly as good as you think. So you should be replacing before end of useful life. You know, replace or refurbish. If it's a mechanical part, you can 
probably just refurbish it. I know I have. Anyway, that's one of the key measures of site-specific failure rates. What is the safety culture? What is the maintenance and operations culture? And uh, in the excellential tool, we have a series of questions which you answer and score, and you can then rate the site safety culture or operations culture at each particular site, enter that into the tool, and the excellential tool will recalculate the PFD, adjusting the failure rates, probabilities of testing successfully, and so forth, to accurately model site-specific failures. And that's why we do not include them in the FMEDA failure rates. Thanks for the question. There's more. Exit of published shutdown valve data in the SERH, yes, with and without proof test. That helps calculate the proof test coverage factor. Yes, that, that is for purposes of that. Uh, does this data assume proof test must include seat leakage or not? Um, any particular proof test, any particular proof test coverage must be defined by a proof test which identifies whether it includes, for example, on a valve, is it only a full stroke or is it a full stroke with a leak test? Obviously, in the FMEDA technique, we can give you proof test coverages for both of those cases, and sometimes we do, depending on, on what the manufacturer has hired us to do in the FMEDA. But the bottom line is, there should always be a proof test example, or at least a rough idea of the proof test, before any proof test coverage is published. Look in the FMEDA report. More. This is good. I noticed that some published FMEDAs for elements report internal fault detection time, but others do not. Ah, ah. Can you explain this? Why it's disclosed in some reports but not in others? Um, it's absolutely disclosed, or should absolutely be disclosed in every certification report, because that's an important variable for certification. It probably should be in every FMEDA report, but I haven't checked the format of our reports lately. And over the years, we have changed the format of FMEDA reports based on feedback from our advisory group, which is primarily end users. So it may be that uh, I have to go check the formats, but it's probably something that should be disclosed. Now, why? It's primarily used to determine if the diagnostics, in other words, the, the, the failures marked detected, can be counted as detected or not as a function of your demand rate. So it's primarily used to distinguish between high demand mode or continuous demand mode. And in continuous demand mode, you can't take any credit for the diagnostics because the dangerous condition occurs more rapidly than the diagnostics. But we have a whole web seminar on that as well. Oh boy, one more. Thank you. Should the end of useful life failures be included in the failure rate calculation? No. Uh, end of useful life is a different and very independent parameter. I guess in reality, when you really get down to very detailed analysis of failure rate data, there is no such thing as a constant failure rate, but we model it with a constant, we model the situation with a constant failure rate during useful life and an end of useful life parameter. So these are two independent parameters meant to distinguish very different things. Now, is it possible? It would be possible to model a non-constant failure rate, but not with any of the simple equations. Uh, Exeter could do it only because we use time-dependent Markov models, but uh, currently even Exeter uses um, constant failure rates in the Markov models. All right. Anyone who has any other comments at any time, 
please feel free to send. Ah, another one. Okay, good. good. How do you see the release of SILSTAT affecting the comparisons listed in this presentation? Well, the bottom line is Exeter has already collected data from end users with SILSTAT because we've had beta sites running for over a year. If customers permit, or if customers permit us to see their data, and we hope they do, because we can offer good analysis services and help them improve their safety, and if they send us the data, I expect we will be doing much more detailed comparisons, and we may discover ways of even improving the data over it, that, that we've already got. Um, the only other factor, of course, is if the customers want to keep their information confidential. Uh, that is their right. If they give permission to have the data published, then we will make the present. Uh, the present this presentation a year from now could look uh, even more comprehensive. I hope that is the case. Thank you for asking. I very much appreciate your time today. If you have any more questions or comments later that you think of, please do not hesitate to send an email. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you have found this uh, well worth your while. And stay tuned for the Exeter Webinar Wednesday series. Thank you very much. Goodbye.